The CCP teaches its citizens that the communist rise to power, which is largely, but largely bloodless, liberation of China. <laughs> oh, really? It brought around prosperity, stability, and liberation. That's interesting, because we've read a few of Frank Dakota's books on China, and uh, Frank Dakota would suggest otherwise. But what does yeah. he know? But the thing is with Frank Dakota's book, so this is the last in his series on Maoist China, and this is the start one, which we were doing last, which was a bit weird, but whatever. Hmm. And the thing with Frank Dakota's books, all three of them, is the party archives were opened up under, I think it's Deng Xiaoping, or whichever one. Yeah. And the old stuff, it wasn't available in Beijing, but if you went to any regional place, the archives were just open to even foreigners. Hmm. So he is a guy from Hong Kong teaching about Chinese studies, went, went in, got all the details, and then made the books. And the books are made off party archive documents. So it means that the only criticism you can actually get of him that is serious mm. is, well, with this many million killed or that many million, Frank, huh? I think you're an anti-communist. It's like, it's, it's, Which he may well agree that he is an anti-communist. But that, that's interesting though, isn't it? Because that actually suggests that this is the best available evidence that we have. For yes. This. And the criticism is, uh, the reason I mention it's so poor is, is because it's so solid, right. the research. And, uh, I mean, I've yet to hear any actual real criticism, to be honest. Uh, it's it's scant. Xi Jinping, to this day, has, has still said that he looks back on this golden age and is actually looking to it for the tools for the modern age oh. as well, which I, I suppose we'll be revealing as we look back at this golden age of Chinese history. We'll start off with chapter one, the, the story of Changchun, which is, is not pretty. When workers in Changchun started digging trenches for a new irrigation system in the summer of 2006, they made a gruesome discovery. The rich black soil was... Let me guess, it's filled with bodies of all ages and all sex. How did you guess? How did I know? <laughs> How did I know? Genius. Clogged with human remains, below a metre of earth, there were thousands of skeletons closely placked together. When they dug deeper, the workers found several more layers of bones, stacked up like firewood. A crowd of local residents gathered around the excavated area was taken aback by the sheer size of the burial site. Some thought that the bodies belonged to the victims of Japanese occupation during the Second World War. Nobody, except an extremely old man, realised that they had just stumbled across the remnants of the civil war that had resumed after 1945 between Mao Zedong's communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. After decades of propaganda about a peaceful liberation of China, Few people remember the victims of the Communist Party's rise to power. Frank writes. And this is where we get the full story of Changchun, if you've mm. never heard it. No, no. Changchun was a minor trading town before the arrival of the railway in 1898. In 1932, Changchun became the capital of Manchukuo, a puppet state of Imperial Japan. The Japanese transformed the city into a modern wheel-shaped city. In August of 1945, the Red Army turned up. And, as far as they could, dismantled the factories, machineries, and materials, sending the war booty back by the train load to the Soviet Union. For people who don't know, the Red Army is, is very much known for just being thieves. Mm. In April 1948, the other Red Army turned up. Mao and his communists advanced towards Changchun, led by Lin Bao. On the 30th of May 1948 came his command. Turn Changchun into a city of death. Direct quote. Why? Got solve it. Inside Changchun was some- Screw these guys. What the hell have they done? <laughs> well, there were 500,000 civilians inside Changchun when the communists turned up, uh, many of them refugees who had fled the communist advance. 100,000 nationalist troops were also garrisoned in the city, right. with 200,000 communists encircling the city from the outside. Okay. In order to prevent famine, the nationalists, evil as they were, encouraged the population to head for the countryside. Once they had left, they were not allowed back, as they could not be fed. Few ever made it past the communist lines. Lin Bao had placed sentries every 50 metres along barbed wire and trenches up to four metres deep. Every exit was blocked. He reported to Mao, direct quote, we don't allow refugees to leave and extort them to return back. This method was very effective in the beginning, but later the famine got worse within the city, and starving civilians would leave the city in droves at all times, day and night. And after we turned them down, they started gathering in areas between our troops and the enemy. Mm. Some of them left their babies and small children with us, absconded. Others hanged themselves in front of our sentry posts. That is what was written to Mal. If it helps, this isn't actually that unique. No, it's not. This is actually something that Caesar even did. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, actually, <laughs> as an example at Alicia. This um, is part of the Civil War era still. Yeah. So mass murder can be 
more expected. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. It can be expected, yes. It's yes, still it evil. Yeah. It was completely unnecessary, but it was a tactic by the communists to try and win the civil war in Changchun, hmm. in Manchuria. For people who don't know what the map looks at this point, the communists basically have been given Manchuria from the Red Army, and that's pretty much it. Hmm. They have to win this and then win the rest of China. So they are going full-scale war and uh, murdering 500,000 civilians for, for, for the war's winning. Half a century later, Wang Junri explained what happened when he was a soldier. We were told they were the enemy and they had to die. Wang was 15 when the communists had forced him to enroll in the army. Well, it's that, that's easy then, isn't it? So the enemy need to die. Simple as. These, these babies. Yeah. Okay. Those women over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. Soldiers absconded throughout the siege. Unlike the civilians who were driven back, they welcomed the soldiers from the nationalist side by the communists and promised them good food and lenient treatment. Now, this is revealing. Well, they probably killed them anyway. No, they did actually take them in. Oh, okay. Because they wanted new recruits. I suppose, it's yeah. As simple as that at this yeah. point. As estimated, 160 civilians were starved to death inside the area between the communists and the nationalists. 160? 160,000. Oh. Sorry. Chang Chun... I was say, that, that's not that bad. <laughs> Chinese history, only 160 <laughs> people die. Yeah, that's, that's a mistake. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good for Chinese history. Chang Chun was like Hiroshima, wrote Zhang Zhenglong, a lieutenant in the People's Liberation Army who documented the siege. The casualties were about the same. Hiroshima took nine seconds. Chang Chung took five months God. of people starving to death to the yeah. point they would hang themselves in front of the communist soldiers. So that was fun. But remember, you could argue, this is the Civil War and things are going to get bad. Uh, they don't stay getting any worse. Uh, well, they don't stay getting any better. Chapter two. So this is a, just laying out how we got to the story of Chang Chung and the fact that this is how China is going to be from now on. So the US... Uh, withdraws any support mm -hmm. for the nationalists pretty much after the ending of the war with Japan. Mm -hmm. The reasoning being that they don't care. It's not very good reasoning. They also decide to go and meet the Reds. Like there was a American representative from the embassy who went to go meet Chairman Mao and the other Reds and was convinced that they actually loved democracy. Oh, they weren't real communists. They they were just they were just putting that on. Oh yeah, who could have uh, who could have doubted? So the United States insisted that Chiang Kai-shek and Mao come to a peace agreement. And Chiang was like, are you an idiot? Uh, this guy's going to kill me. Yeah, they were idiots. So anyway, meanwhile, with the Russians, who, who are not as stupid, were helping the communists transform their ragtag army of guerrilla fighters into a formidable war machine. The Americans became so disillusioned with the nationalists that they started cutting off deliveries of armaments as trainloads of equipment moved back and forth across the border between Manchuria and the Soviet Union, the United States began refusing to license military equipment to China, including sales for which the government had already paid. Then, in September 1946, Truman imposed an arms embargo. Why? On the nationalists. It lasted until July 1947. I mean, it just sounds like they want the communists to take over. Truman's advisors, it seems, were really fucking stupid. <laughs> Uh, they honestly, in it's from the letters they wrote back to Washington, they honestly believed that the Reds believed in democracy. They honestly believed they weren't real communists. They honestly believed they weren't really siding with Moscow. They're just 200,000 of them in arms, paid for by the Soviet Union for communism. They're not real communists. Yeah. So Truman, who is you know famously known for the Truman Doctrine, yeah. we need to fight the Reds wherever they are, uh, in the early outsets of the Cold War, no. No, Idiot. he... he, he he learned the lesson of fighting the Reds wherever they are the hard way. Right. So Beijing falls. Fantastic. They, they win in Manchuria, yep. in case you're wondering. And, uh, well, the reason Beijing fell so easily, it turns out, was because of Chang Chung. They, they remembered what had happened. The communists were supported by some 5 million men and women, sometimes even children, conscripted by a tough party leader called Deng Xiaoping, mm. who we now remember as a reformer and good man <laughs> because he liberalised China. Yeah, all of these people have a past. Yeah. These pick-and-shove crews not only provided logistical support, carrying food and material on their backs to the front, but they were also used as human shields. Forced to march in front of the troops, dense waves of unarmed villagers overwhelmed the nationalist lines. Ling Jiangku... I mean, it's literally <laughs> Mongol tactics. Yeah. The Mongols did this. All-out war. 
It, it is amazing. Chinese history is just, it's just it's so awful. I, I, the reason I love this modern period of history as mm. well, like going on from the start of, sort of World War Two onwards, uh, why I don't prefer the ancient stuff, is because with modern weapons, this becomes so inhumane. It's it's hard to not laugh at because you've lost your mind. We have uh, Lin Changku, an ordinary soldier in the trenches among the nationalists, remembers years later that his hands went numb from firing bullets into a sea of civilians. Now, that was how life was. If you were in the nationalists, you had to literally murder civilians en masse before you even ended up fighting the Reds. The Mongols unironically did this, you know. Yeah. Like they'd drive waves of just Chinese civilians into the ranks of whoever they were attacking. It's a good tactic. It's just awful. When you've got unlimited Chinese civilians. Um, <laughs> Two billion and counting. Raping and pillaging happens everywhere. Obviously. Funnily enough. When the Red Army got to Shanghai, they managed to get the city to switch sides without a shot being fired. No disorder even took place because just before they arrived, there were posters going up, trucks going through the streets. We will defeat the Reds. We stand with Chiang Kai-shek. And then when the Reds turned up, all of those posters went down. The Red Army marched in and everyone put up posters of Mao. Hmm. All because they had known what had happened to Chang Chung and went, <laughs> well, it is uh, so, again nothing new here in the history of warfare. Yep, certainly isn't. It's just Chinese warfare is d- d- worse in numbers. Mm. The population were relieved. They continued to call the soldiers derogatory names in in Shanghai, and circled yokel jokes about them. One anecdote uh, described a team who found a white porcelain toilet and tried to wash rice in it. A soldier pulled the rope attached to the cistern, only to look on aghast when the rice vanished and the bubbles <laughs> came up from the bowl. <laughs> hey, yokels. <sighs> well, <Yeah. laughs> I mean, in his defense, he has probably never encountered a toilet before. Yeah. So, uh, so funnily enough, the, the communists won. Um, nobody helped the nationalists. The nationalists didn't help themselves in some instances by not mm. being as brutal and uh, inhumane as the communists. So they lost the war. And <laughs> weirdly, the nationalists didn't just want to massacre Chinese civilians forever. So they lost. Anyway, <laughs> then the Chinese, I'm going to skip over because it's just history at this point. Yeah. Reds took over all of the Qing Empire, excluding Taiwan and Hong Kong with mm-hmm. ease. Obviously excluding Manchuria, Mongolia and Tanatuva, but uh, that's, that's, they're not going to argue with Stalin over that. Then we move on to chapter three. So most sensible people, once this victory had been declared, fled for Hong Kong and Taiwan. Or Southeast Asia. That's why there's so many Chinese. In Wherever those else, yeah. Yeah, because they knew the hell was coming. Ying Meijun, for instance, bade farewell to her one year old son at the railway station in September 1949. The boy was crying so much that she left him in the care of his grandma- her grandmother, fearful of taking him in an overcrowded train. She would not see her firstborn child again until 1987 when he was a 40-year-old man broken by years of hard labour on a state farm. Jesus. So anyone who left, yeah, you're very lucky, to say the least. Everyone who remained underwent, quote, brainwashing. That's actually the term they used. Yeah, it's, I, like, it's translated, isn't it? But it basically means scrubbing the mind or I, something. I had to make sure with John, because I just honestly didn't believe it. And he was like, yeah, yeah no, that means like scrubbing the mind. Yeah. So, huh, okay. They also decided to uh, deport all the parasites from the big cities. I mean, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. No, honestly, this was winning me over. (laughs) So they decided to deport all beggars, thieves, and prostitutes to uh, either be reformed or to work hard labor because they were literal parasites, and as they put it, which... um, The reformed, they were then sent to wastelands if if they couldn't be properly reformed. That was a death sentence, so that, 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 that did nothing. Um, the economy collapses due to the war and all the distrust of foreigners coming about. The English language was actually expunged from all of China. There, there's a funny anecdote where a foreigner goes down to some Chinese official's desk to get a visa to leave, hmm. and he tries to talk to him in English because they'd always spoken to him in English in Shanghai. And the Chinese worker points to a new sign that just says Chinese only and begins laughing. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Dick. But yeah, okay. That's, uh, I, I, you know, not yeah. entirely opposed to that. Except maybe the just completely destroying the economy part. They, this came in the fact that they just decided anything foreign needs to die, which meant all business and trades and everything. So, good good policy. Mm. Chapter four. They decide to uh, get the country peasants to kill the rich peasants. The redistrib- rich peasants, yes. And redistribute their riches. Which, yeah. 
And more kulaks, I see. A funny thing about all this, I didn't know. This may actually make sense in Russian at the time that the Bolsheviks did it, because you can make the argument of serfdom, feudalism, blah, blah, blah. These words actually at least meant something. Yeah. It made no sense in reality, but you L- can understand the term. Sure, but like the kulak, look at him, he's got a cow. Yeah, it's really stupid even there. Yeah. But it's even stupider in China, I found out, because as Frank de Cola lays out, at the time that they decided this land reform would come and they would get all the country peasants to kill the rich peasants, the word feudalism didn't even really exist in Chinese. Well, of course not. Well, it would have back in the age of you know medieval China, but since the Qing Empire had come about, this whole concept of landlords and feudal lords, and it just didn't exist. No, didn't the emperor own everything? No, by the time of Qing China, most civilians actually had property rights. Oh, really? They had the right, ability okay. to buy and trade their land. Oh. Some of it was more advanced than we are today, oh. which is weird. Like, it would make distinctions between the topsoil and the uh, wealth of whatever was below the topsoil. <laughs> right. Like, the minerals or whatever, yeah. which most people had no reason to have anyway, but yeah. whatever. It's it's there. Hmm. Uh, but all these peasants were came to and told about the feudalism they lived under. They were like, what? Your landlord. Aren't you being oppressed here? (laughs) A lot of brainwashing had to happen for this to work, but it did. One man recalls getting a horse leg from killing 10% of his village. Got a whole horse leg. I killed 10% of my village? Yeah. He actually is quite ecstatic about that. There's a quote from him saying, well, my granddad didn't have a horse leg. Well, there we go. Going up in the world. (laughs) What? It's a couple of dinners. Sure. Um, So there's that. Apparently, the Japanese language was the first instance of infusing these words back in Chinese at the time. Right. So it's it's funny that the communists are actually imposing Japanese feudalism back on... Yeah, whatever. Deng Xiaoping described his experience in land reform in uh, Anhu. In one place in western Anhu, the masses hated several landlords and demanded that they be killed. So we followed their wishes and killed them. After they had been killed... The masses feared reprisals from the relatives of the victims. So we drew up an even longer list of names, saying that God. if we could kill them, everything would be fine. So, again, we followed the wishes of the masses and killed those people. God, this really is the meme, isn't it? Communism is just one more murder away from success. After they had been killed, Deng Xiaoping writes, the masses thought that even more people would seek revenge. So they came to us with an even longer list of names. And again, we killed according to the wishes of the masses. We kept killing, and the masses kept on feeling more and more insecure. <laughs> <laughs> Taking fright and eventually fleeing the village itself. In the end, we killed 200 people, and all the work we did in 12 villages was ruined. Because the people who remained fled. I can't believe you can't just kill off all the people you dislike and everything becomes brilliant. Funny of that. It's amazing. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.